In this video, I'm going to uh, take you through an activity around standard draw and uh, creating methods. Uh, so if you haven't already, you want to download the standard draw methods.zip file from the website. And if you're going to work on, uh, if you in there, there are two um, PDFs from Princeton. Uh, one is the uh, this function activity, and the other is the standard draw activity. Uh, you can print these out, you can work on paper, and then um, come back and uh, watch the rest of the video. Or if you want, you can do what I did, which was create a Eclipse project and put those uh, uh, Java files in there, and then you can complete it using your computer. So go ahead and pause the video now, and then work on those two activities, and then when you come back, I'll uh, show you, I'll uh, walk you through the solutions. Okay, so I'm going to start with the checkerboard, the standard draw activity, and the goal here is to produce a uh, n by n red and black checkerboard using standard draw. And the first missing bit of code is right here. We want to read in this command line argument, so you can see it's supposed to take a integer n from the command line as the first argument. And so to read that in, what do we do? Well, we do integer dot parse int. Oops. And we pass it that first uh, argument from the command line. But remember, because it's a, a string array, it's of type string. And we want to store it in an integer variable called n. And so we must run it through a type conversion method. And we're using the parse int method inside the integer class. We want to create a n by n checkerboard. We've got a, a outer for loop going from 0 up to, but not including n. And now we want to have another loop, j. And so the i is going to index the x value, the j is going to index the y value. So if we're doing an n by n grid, we need to go over n values in the x and n values in the y. So this j loop is going to just be symmetric with the i loop. So j is going to go until it's uh, as long as it's strictly less than n, and then it's going to increment. What's going on in the next line? Here we're adding i plus j and then doing percent two. Well, what's percent two? Well, this is, remember, this is the modulo operator. This is seeing, um, returning the remainder. So if we add i plus j and divide by two, what's the remainder? Uh, and it's a standard sort of idiom in, in programming languages, something like percent two. Uh, if you were to see if that's equal to zero, then that means it's an even number. And so if we add i plus j percent 2 and see if it's equal to 0, it will basically alternate between being even and odd, the sum of i and j. And that's kind of what we're going for. We want the um, adjacent boxes in our checkerboard to be different colors. Here's it setting it black. And uh, if, it's, if it's even, it's going to set it to black. If it's odd, let's set it to red. So this is uh, the same code, but instead of setting standard draw dot black, we sent standard draw dot red, and then we need to provide the x and the y coordinate for the checkerboard. Remember, i is the x coordinate, and j is the y coordinate. So usually, what people do is they first try this, and so there's nothing wrong with trying it. Let's let's give that a shot. All right, so I need to set my command line argument. Make sure we're running checkerboard. Shall we do, I don't know, let's do a 5x5 five five checkerboard. All right, I'll move the window over here so you can see it. And it's close. We're getting the alternating pattern, but you can notice it's kind of offset. And remember, standard draw always draws these rectangles in the center. So we're giving the center point. And what's its first drawing point going to be? Well, the first time through the loop, i is going to be 0 and j is going to be 0. All right, and it's going to draw a filled square at 0, 0, which is actually down here. and and so this is that first rectangle, that first square is down here, where in fact we wanted it uh, to be uh, have its lower left coordinate at uh, 0, 0. All right? And if you didn't notice, I mean, you use i and j because uh, normally, right, standard draw, the uh, standard draw, the bounds on standard draw are 0, 0.0 to 1.0. But look, we've set the x scale to be 0 through n, and the y scale will be 0 through n. Therefore, we can reference, so we have 0 here, and we have 5 over here, and then we have 0 on the y, and then 5 at the top. And to fix this, 
all we need to do is to offset. Since each of these squares are at half of the, the side length is 0 0.5, if we offset by 0 0.5 in both the x and the y direction, that's going to kick the checkerboard up into the right and so now we've got a correct checkerboard and now it's drawing at 0 0.5 0 0.5 that first square and then working its way over to i equals um, well sorry first it goes up does the j uh, increments j right so it does i equals 0 then does all the j's draws this first one and then draws the other ones and we could probably if we wanted to see that uh, it's always fun to see how things are going we can put in a, a delay I don't know 500 milliseconds and now if we draw it here, and I have to move the window really quick. Oh, and there it goes. So you missed the beginning there, oh, sorry. You can see this is the direction it's drawing the, the checkerboard in. All right, so that's checkerboard. Let's have a look, uh, if you haven't already done the standard, uh, if you haven't done the uh, methods uh, exercises, go ahead and do those. And I'll start out with the maxi example. Here the goal is to take the maximum of three integers. All right, read from standard input. And then there's also a second form where we're doing the uh, largest of three doubles. Uh, I don't know. Let's start. We could start down in the main if we want. Input three integers from standard input. And so we can call them. Let's call the first integer A. And just as usual, we need to run it through parse int to convert that string to an integer. And now we need a b and a c. All right, and don't, don't forget, a common mistake when you're cutting and pasting, always be careful when you're cutting and pasting like that. Um, be sure you go back and change the things you need to change about whatever you just pasted in. And I want the first, second, and third command line argument, put it in as a, b, and c. All right, and we're going to get the max, and let's put the max into the local variable. We'll call max 3 a, b, c. So of course this isn't going to work yet, right? It's complaining it doesn't know what max 3 is. Um, and that's because we haven't put this function in yet. So let's go ahead and uh, finish max 3. Write the function max 3 to return the largest of three integers. It needs to return an integer. What's its return type got to be? Well, it needs to return an integer, so it obviously has a return type of integer. Its input is three separate integers, all right, and so I'm going to just call them a, b, and c. I could have called them anything, though. There's no reason I couldn't call these d, e, and f if I wanted to. All right, They're, they have no relation to the a, b, c in the main program. So if I want to call them d, e, and f, I, I certainly can. Uh, and then how shall we do the max? Well, there's a number of ways to do it. Um, I'll show you uh, one way students often think to do it, which would be, well, let's first see if, um, you know, if D is greater than E and D is greater than F, okay, if those two things are true, so D is bigger than E and D is bigger than F, well, then what's the answer? Well, then it's D. And you could also maybe D isn't the bigger, maybe E is greater than D and E is greater than F. Well then, what's the answer? Then it's E. And if none of those things are, if neither of those happen, well then who's the biggest? Well then it's got to be F. And let's go ahead and we'll put a system.outprintlin down here. And let's print out what the max is. And let's try it out, make sure we test it. Uh, run it there, it's going to crash because I haven't put any command line arguments yet. And let's so we're on maxi, set the arguments, and let's see, let's find the max of 2, 5, and 9, for example. 2, 5, 9 is 9. Oh, so it must work. Well, always good to um, do some more testing. So let's go 5, 2, 9. Let's mix the order up a bit. Max is still 9. Put a 9 in there, see what that. All right, seems to be working. Let's do the same thing, but let's do it with doubles. If we're finding the, the maximum of three doubles, then obviously our max needs to return a double. And now we can take three doubles as parameters, double A, double B, and double C. 
how should we do it this time? Well, we could do it this way, but eh, that takes three lines. I, I know how to do that in one line. Now, what would be nice, right? We've got a math.max function. So what it would be nice to be able to do is to do this. Send it three command line arguments or three uh, parameters to the method max and then return the maximum. Unfortunately, the math, the people that made the math library didn't include an overloaded version like that. Um, and so you're not allowed to do that, but you can, you still use math.max. Math.max can only take the maximum of two numbers. Here it takes the maximum of A and B. And what we can do is we can just chain them together, like something like so. This inner part will go first, determine the maximum of A and B, and then the winner of that competition will compete against C, and then the maximum of that will be returned. All right. And if we want to test this out, we could go and change our data type, change that to a double. And let's change all these to be doubles. And then we also have to remember we need to change this to parse double, double dot parse double to parse the double into a parse the string into a double primitive. OK. And we could still run with the same command line arguments, right? It's just converting those integers to uh, floating point values. But we can also test it out. We could put in some decimals here. And it should now return 9.1. So those are two different solutions to how to do a maximization of three numbers. The final exercise reverse. The goal of reverse one is to take an array of strings and return a new array that is a reversal of that. So what shall we add to this or what shall we change? This first version specifies do not alter the original array. What's the original array? Well, it's whatever we're passing in um, to the method. Let's just call it uh, D for data. It's a of type integer array. We can't modify it. so. In order to do the reversal, what we're going to do is we're going to specify we're returning an array of integers from the method. And so what do we need to do? Well, we need to copy this guy, but we need to kind of copy it and reverse its order. Uh, first thing we're going to need is a result array. I'm going to call it a result. It's of type integer array. And we have to instantiate, create the memory for that. How big does it need to be? Well, it needs to be the same length as the past in data. And it's complaining because I'm not returning something. So I could do this. But what this is going to do is not just return an array of all zeros. right? I actually need to fill in the result array with the reversed values. And so I can make a loop that goes through all the integer indexes of the past in array, and I want to reverse it. So I, if I did something like this, this would be a copy. This would be saying copy, um, put into result bracket 0 whatever's in D bracket 0. And so that would be a straight copy. I'm going for uh, a reversal. And so what I can do is, uh, in one side or the other, is I can cause this thing to start at the end and work its way to the other side. So what am I going to put into the first element of the result array? Well, I'm going to put the last element. This says start at the last element, and then I'm going to work my way uh, from that last element forward by subtracting i. So the first time it comes through, it's going to be i equals 0, right? And so it will start at d dot length minus 1, which is the last valid address in the, the d array, and then uh, work its way backwards as i increases. Let's test it out by printing out the args array. Uh, so we've got the uh, args array. Let's uh, put it into a new, uh, well, I don't know, we'll call it backwards and reverse one. And we're going to pass that the args array. And then let's loop over the result. All right, and each loop. What we'll do is we'll print out 
whatever is in that and we'll print a space and actually I think I won't go down a line so I'll just print everything with spaces and then once I'm done I'll print a return. Whoops! So what's the problem? <laughs> I'm sending in a string array and what did I do? Oh, I built this. All right. So if I was in a classroom, nobody would have probably let me get this far with, uh, without telling me. But this thing was supposed to reverse an array of strings, and I made it reverse an array of integers. Okay, well, it's actually no big deal because I can just come in here and change my data types, and I need to change them everywhere. So I'm now operating on an array of strings, and it will work just, just the same. All right, so the basic mechanism is the same. I'll run it. Okay, and let me show you the command line arguments I put in there. One, two, three, four, five, six, just as words. And then when I run it, we in fact get the reversed version of it. If I really wanted to test it, I might do something like um, let's reverse it, and then I'll take that backwards version, I'll send it in, and then put it back in the thing I'm calling backwards. And so what should be the result now? Yeah, I'll end up back with the array in normal order. That's doing the reversal without modifying the original array. Okay, because it, let's get rid of this second reverse. If I were to print out, oh, oh, what did I press there? Okay, let's copy this and let me print out the args array instead. This is what was the original input to reverse one. And let's print that out after I've done the reversal and printed the reversal out. Okay, this is a reverse version, and then this is a normal version. Notice the normal version hasn't hasn't been modified. Another choice you could make is not to do that. You could make it reverse in place, so actually change the elements. Because remember, when you have an array as an input to a method, you're allowed to change the elements, and those changes are reflected after the uh, method completes. Reverse2 doesn't return anything. All right, anything that doesn't return anything, you always have to declare a void return type. And let's pass in a string array this time. And now we need to do the reversal. The only tricky bit is, all right, we're not going to do this. We're not going to create a new array. We're just going to use this array D and do the reversal in place. Uh, so let's copy part of this anyway. So this is going to loop over all the positions of the D array. And what I want to do is swap them. I'm going to start from the outside and swap those two, and then go one in and swap them, and then work my way all the way to the center. So I only need to go halfway, right? So as I get towards the center, eventually I'm going to swap the two there right in the center, and then I'm done. Okay? Because I only want to go halfway, I don't actually want to go all the way up to D dot length. I just go up to D dot length uh, divided by two. All right? And Oops, my array is now called. I'm doing it in place. And so, well, how do I set the that very first one, i equals 0? Well, I want to set it actually equal to the last one, all right, which is d dot length minus 1 minus i. All right, this will copy that last guy into the first guy. But the problem is we want to save off that first guy before we do that because once we've done this line, this is putting this value, the last guy's value, into the first guy's value. And then we lost track of what the first guy's value was. All right? And we need it because in order to set this last guy's value, uh, we need a copy of it. And so a standard way to do something like this is to set up a temporary variable. And it gets the first guy before we blow it away. And then once I've done that, I can go ahead and put the, the saved off value back in the original. We can change the program now to call reverse2. Alright, and whoops, it's got no return type, so it's not happy about that. So we don't need this extra backwards array. And I'm going to change these guys to be args. Okay, and what we'll see now, so we don't really need two of those guys. After we run reverse, in fact, the args array now has been modified. So those two different choices, and depending, and you'll see uh, libraries that have methods that do it 
one way like this without modifying your input parameters, but there will also be libraries that will have methods that will modify input parameters. But remember, you can only modify parameters that are um, elements of an array or, as we'll talk about later, things that are of uh, a reference type, but not um, not string uh, single strings. We can only do this on the strings here because it's an array of strings. All right, if this was a single string, uh, you wouldn't be able to modify that single string. You can only modify this because it's an array of strings.